Animal testing. You work as a chef, and you're trying to perfect a new recipe for the restaurant. So instead of serving the trial dishes to the restaurant first, you give the first batch to your family members to see how well they receive it. Now this was exactly what scientists did with the idea of animal testing. Basically, after creating some concoction in the lab, they'd look for unsuspecting rabbits or rats and try out their mixture on them. Sometimes it works, and other times it'll result in about a million dead rabbits or a scene straight out of the Planet of the Apes. Now, most of the huge modern-day discoveries, like the use of modern anesthesia, were all possible because of animal testing. Scientists like Louis Pasteur and Jonas Salk also used animals as lab rats to develop vaccines for diseases like rabies and polio. In fact, if if there's a medical breakthrough, chances are there's a lab animal somewhere with a story to tell. However, this procedure has caused quite a controversy because animal rights activists do not believe that poor old Garfield has to die before grandma can get her flu shot. Euthanasia. It's been exactly two years since you were in the ghastly car accident that got both your legs and one arm amputated because of how much damage they sustained. You've gone through a brain surgery that's left you a complete shell of who you used to be. Basically, a According to you, dying is a better option compared to the pain and loss you're suffering, and you've pleaded with your doctors to please just end your life with dignity. So basically, euthanasia is a weird concept of voluntary murder. This idea of ending one's life with dignity started when Dr. Jack Kevorkian, also known as Dr. Death, the poster boy for physician-assisted suicide in the 1990s, thought that people who had terminally incurable diseases with little to no quality of life had the right to decide when they wanted to die. It was like adding a checkbox in the section next to your name that says, kill me if I don't get better. This concept gained many supporters because they claimed that euthanasia allows people to die with dignity and have control over their final moments, instead of being hooked up to machines or being in constant pain. Basically, if you wouldn't let your dog suffer through endless pain, why would you let a loved one go through it? However, it quickly became a serious cause of discussion for the people who were against this view because, according to them, life in itself is very precious. And once society allows doctors to start mercy killing people, then where does it end? Before you know it, doctors are offering euthanasia with your flu shot. Do you want the nasal spray or the eternal option? The point is it could be abused tomorrow, and people who are going through a bad breakup or worse, going through a bad hair day might want to be euthanized. So while some parts of the world have accepted this procedure, the rest are still debating whether dying with dignity is a human right or another shot at playing God. In vitro fertilization, IVF. IVF is basically a method where doctors help couples have a baby by fertilizing an egg outside the body and then placing it back into the woman's uterus, hoping it'll stick around and grow into a bouncing bundle of joy. It sounds like science fiction, but it's as real as your next family reunion's awkward conversations. Now, for some people who have had a really hard time getting pregnant, the natural way of IVF have stepped in and with the help of their doctors, they've been able to have a baby. However, the line between this and the ethical aspect of IVF really bothers some people. Imagine being able to make a baby outside the human body. For some people, this feels like stepping into God's territory, kind of like if you suddenly became the captain of the life creation team without the whole divine certification. One of the biggest controversies comes from the extra embryos. See, IVF doesn't just create one embryo, it creates several just in case the first one doesn't work out. Kind of like having backup outfits for a big date. You never know which one's gonna hit the sweet spot. But when you're done with your IVF journey, what happens to those unused embryos? Some couples decide to freeze them for later, which sounds like the science fiction version of, hey, maybe I want another kid in five years. Others donate them to science, but this is where things get dicey. To some people, embryos are potential lives, and destroying or experimenting on them feels like we're turning them into science experiments instead of future little humans. Many religions also have strong opinions on when life begins. For some, life starts at conception, meaning the moment the sperm meets the egg, it's game on for life. That makes handling embryos outside the body a real hot-button issue for some groups because they're not exactly thrilled about the idea of keeping tiny potential humans in cold storage like frozen pizza rolls, just waiting for a possible thaw-out session. CRISPR babies. Just imagine if you could design your future child 
trial, like choosing options for a car, picking eye color, intelligence, or even resistance to certain diseases. Sounds like science fiction, right? Well, it's not that far off, and it's all thanks to something called CRISPR, which basically stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Try saying that five times fast. CRISPR is like a pair of high-tech genetic scissors that scientists can use to cut, add, or replace bits of DNA. Basically, editing genes like you'd edit a sentence in a word doc. Now this science really hit the big time back in 2012 when some scientists decided to make genetic editing the new Pinterest hobby. Why fix dinner when you can fix your DNA was probably the vibe. But things really went next level bananas when a scientist named Hei Jian Kui used CRISPR to edit the genes of unborn babies. And he didn't just stop at any babies. Nope, this guy decided to genetically tweak twin girls, Lulu and Nana, to make them resistant to HIV. These girls were born as the world's first genetically modified humans before they'd even had their first diaper change. Naturally, this sparked a global freakout because nobody was super comfortable with the idea of a doctor playing God with a genetic lottery. It raises some pretty wild possibilities like designer babies, where wealthy parents could start ordering children like they're picking upgrades for a new iPhone. Oh, I'll take the one with the athletic ability of LeBron, the IQ of Einstein, and the cheekbones of a Hollywood star, please. And here's the kicker, there's no control Z when you mess with DNA. You can't just hit undo if you accidentally turn someone's eye color pink or give them an unintended superpower. Any mistake is permanent, and those tweaks get passed down to future generations like a bad family recipe that no one can escape. Cloning. Let's say you have a favorite Lego set, and you want to make an exact copy of it piece by piece. You can't just wave a magic wand and say abracadabra to make another one appear, that would definitely be convenient. Instead, you have to find each block and put them together exactly like the original. Well, that's technically what cloning is. It's not magic, but the scientific act of carefully copying the tiny building blocks inside your body called cells. It's like they got tired of having one of something and instead decided to just mix and match genes to create two of everything. Now, the first guys to attempt this absurd experiment were scientists Ian Wilmot and Keith Campbell, who literally started by trying to create a sheep from scratch. Amazingly, after 277 attempts, they were successful, and in July 1996, Dolly the Lamb was born, and she was the proof that scientists had figured out how to hit copy and paste on a whole organism. While scientists were drooling over the possibilities, like kids in a candy store because at this point, resurrecting dinosaurs seemed possible, the ethical crowd was having a collective meltdown. Religious leaders and ethicists were firing up their PowerPoint presentations faster than you can say Mary had a little lamb. They were worried about the technology falling into the wrong hands. Imagine a world with a hundred Hitler clones, the sheer terror. Also, poor Dolly didn't exactly hit the genetic jackpot as she suffered more health issues than a paranoid hypochondriac. She had tumors, lung disease, and arthritis, which just further proved what the religious leaders feared, that the health status of the clones wasn't exactly going to win any trophies. Unfortunately, Dolly bid farewell to this world in 2001, and her body has been immortalized and kept in the National Museum of Scotland. Surrogacy Surrogacy is technically like an Uber, but for the uterus. One person needs a ride, and another person provides the vehicle. But in this case, one person needs a child, and another person is willing to carry and birth that child. Well, that's the watered-down version of it. Basically, it involves taking the sperm cell and the egg cell of both parents and mixing them up in a lab like you're making a bizarre cocktail, and just like that, you've got yourself an embryo. Then, the next step is to simply implant the embryo into the willing human incubator for the next Nine months. It's like a uterine Airbnb, spacious and complete with room service 24-7. Now, the first successful surrogacy happened in 1976 in the USA, and it was a dream come true for couples struggling with infertility, same-sex couples, and single people who wanted to join parenthood. But not everyone was on board with this baby-making bonanza. Imagine you're carrying a baby for nine months only to give it up after delivery. It's a little like putting together an Ikea chair, except instead of furniture, 
it's a whole human. This raises a big question, who owns the baby? Yeah, it sounds like a bad reality TV show, but surrogacy stirs up ethical dilemmas faster than you can say parental yoga. Some people thought it could exploit women, especially if they were in a financially vulnerable position. It's like saying, I'll pay you to go through nine months of cravings, back pain, and swollen ankles, but no pressure. Aside from this, there was also the fact that you've got contracts, lawyers, and potential court battles that could rival any courtroom drama. Each country, and sometimes each state, has different laws about surrogacy. Some places treat surrogacy like it's totally normal, while others have more regulations than a nuclear power plant. In some cases, there's even drama about parental rights. Imagine you're the intended parents, and after the baby is born, the surrogate suddenly decides she wants to keep it. It's like ordering a pizza and the delivery guy saying, actually, I think I'll eat this one myself. On the flip side, what if the intended parents back out? Now the surrogates are left with a baby and a dilemma. Transgender healthcare. Basically, if you're transgender, you'll feel like you were born right but in the wrong body. And this feeling of mismatch can cause immense psychological distress. So in order to correct this, transgender healthcare comes into play. Technically, transgender individuals didn't just start appearing in the 20th century like new iPhones. They've actually been around for centuries. But after so long of playing tag, Western medicine began to catch up in the 20th century. One of the earliest documented cases was a Danish woman named Lily Elba, who underwent sex reassignment surgery in the 1930s. She basically offered herself up as a sacrificial lamb to perfect the process. She became the human equivalent of a lab rat. Now, Today, there are a whole lot of options for transgender healthcare, from hormone therapy to surgery. It's like an all-you-can-eat buffet of medical services. While these procedures help manage the emotional and social challenges of being transgender, some argue that it is as unnatural as delicious pineapple on pizza, and the effects of such a life-changing procedure in the long run might be disastrous. Currently, so many parents are fighting against this procedure being available to children because they might wake up one morning and regret it all like a man who got a sleeve tattoo after being wasted at the bar. Thalidomide Thalidomide was regarded as a magical elixir in the 1950s. It was marketed as a wonder drug that could cure everything from anxiety to morning sickness. If you were a pregnant woman then and complained of nausea, then you'd be given thalidomide. If you had headaches, thalidomide to the rescue. If you couldn't sleep, well, you guessed it, a healthy dose of thalidomide. Soon, doctors started noticing something really strange. Babies born to women who took thalidomide had severe deformities. Instead of having fully formed arms and legs, many babies were born with phocomelia, a condition where their limbs were stunted or, in some cases, almost entirely missing. Imagine trying to assemble a toy robot, but the arms and legs just never show up in the box. Some babies were born with flipper-like arms, some without any limbs at all. It was like a tragic real-life game of guess what body part is missing. This wasn't just a handful of cases either. Over 10,000 babies in more than 40 countries were affected. To make matters worse, many of these babies didn't survive infancy. Now, once the birth defects started popping up, you'd think the stuff would have been pulled from the shelves immediately. But instead, the drug company decided to wait and see if it was all just a coincidence. This delay made the situation worse, like putting a do not disturb sign on a door that's on fire. It wasn't until 1961, several years after the drug was first introduced, that thalidomide was finally pulled from the market. Organ transplantation. Back in the day, if your organs decided to quit on you, that was it, game over. But then some guys in a lab coat thought about swapping organs, like car parts. And just like that, organ transplantation was born. Of course, the first attempt at an organ transplant was a huge failure because, as it turns out, you can't just take a random heart and stuff it into your body. There are a series of tests that go into making that decision. Apparently, the body is picky with what organs it gets to take. The first successful organ transplant surgery was carried out by Dr. Joseph Murray in 1954. He transplanted a kidney between identical twins. Since his victory, organ transplantation has migrated to the next step, but with a shortage of organs in the organ room, doctors believe they should be able to collect the organs of people who are dead or on the verge of dying since they probably won't have any need for it in heaven. Some moralists had a problem with taking the organs of people who hadn't really walked into the light, and so it became a twisted race of trying
trying to figure out when someone was dead enough to donate organs. Moreover, some family members of the deceased weren't too big on the idea of their loved one being carved up like a Thanksgiving turkey after death. Sodium Thiopental Truth Serum if you watch a lot of blockbuster movies, then you must have seen a scene where they use something called a truth serum to get the truth out of someone. Well, this actually isn't all fiction, but something that actually exists in real life. But in real life, sodium thiopental isn't quite as exciting as getting people to confess their crushes or reveal that they actually re-gifted that blender you gave them last year. Basically, sodium thiopental is actually a barbiturate, which means it's part of a class of drugs that can slow down brain activity. In other words, it's like like hitting the chill button on your brain. In medicine, it's mainly used as an anesthetic to knock people out before surgery. But here's where things get spicy. People realize that when someone was given sodium thiopental, they would sometimes get really chatty like they had no filter at all. This led to the idea that it could be used to get people to tell the truth. Thus, the legend of the truth serum was born. Uh, however, the problem with the so-called truth serum is that while it makes people more talkative, it doesn't guarantee that they're telling the truth. In fact, people might start making stuff up, not because they're lying on purpose, but because their brain is all foggy. Imagine trying to have a serious conversation after waking up from a long nap. You might say anything just to get back to sleep. This led to a lot of false confessions. Someone could be babbling away about how they were the mastermind behind an international jewelry heist, when in reality they just borrowed their sister necklace without asking. Another big reason sodium thiopental is controversial is that using it during interrogations can be seen as coercive. Essentially, you're messing with someone's brain chemistry to get them to talk, which is a bit like cheating in a game of poker. It raises a lot of ethical questions about free will and consent. Just because someone is relaxed and chatty doesn't mean they want to be. Well, today, sodium thiopental is still used, but not as a truth serum because, let's face it, it's terrible at that. It's main job now is as an anesthetic in surgeries. When you're being prepped for an operation, a little bit of sodium thiopental can help you relax and knock you out before the big snooze fest that is surgery.